we will talk about uh, oculomotor nerve. Bayan, so to you, Wadah? Wadah, Dr. Are you hearing me? Okay. Mumtaz. Right. Today we will start about uh, talking about oculomotor nerve. Let us start. Um, okay. So uh, the crania, the oculomotor nerve of the of the eye is the cranial nerve oculomotor, uh, trochlear, and abducens are the motor nerve of the eye. If you have a paper and uh, pen, it will be nice because there is a few things I want you to take notes of while I'm giving the lecture. So it will be a uh, better understanding. So in um, this picture here, Try to test yourself and tell me what is this nerve? Write it in your piece of paper. What is this nerve name? What is this nerve? And what is this nerve? What is A, B, C, and D? Each one write it in his own paper and and he will check himself. So, this is the third nerve, fourth nerve, oculomotor, fifth nerve, trigeminal, and the sixth nerve, abducent. Um, today, I'm talking about oculomotor nerve. There is general information about oculomotor nerve. The nuclei lies in the midbrain. All the nuclei of the oculomotor nerve, of the cranial nerve lies in the brainstem. The oculomotor nerve carry the parasympathetic fiber. So this is a characteristic of the oculomotor nerve. It carry the parasympathetic fibers. Paralysis of the oculomotor nerve, of the ocular, oculomotor nerve causes deficit of ocular motility in the field of action of the muscle innervated. These are in general. Let's go to the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve. What is the oculomotor nerve supply? The third nerve supply superior rectus muscle, inferior rectus, medial, medial rectus, inferior oblique, levator palpebris superior, superioris muscle, ciliary body, and pupillary sphincter. So seven things are supplied by the third nerve. Now, if we see uh, this diagram uh, in the prefilis, so this is to see the seven, seven things which the oculomotor nerve supply, it divided when it go to the eye into superior division and inferior division. The superior division will supply the levator palpebri superioris and the superior oblique, while the inferior division will supply the major rectus, will supply the inferior oblique, and fibers will go to the ciliary ganglia and to the iris sphincter. So let us go about anatomy of the oculomotor nerve because um, I am interested of applied anatomy, the anatomy which is going to give you a clue about uh, what is the patient having, what is the diagnosis, what is the finding you find in the patient and what is the diagnosis. So the third nerve nuclei are located in the midbrain below the equiduct of sylvius at the level of the superior colliculus. Here, this you can see, this is the midbrain. 
Here is the superior colloquius, so the third nerve nucleus to the right side, uh, to the right side and the left side lie, lie below the aqueduct of salvius. What we see here in the midbrain is this the red nucleus and this is the pyramidal tract. Okay, so there is part of the nerve in the nucleus, part of the nerve in merging within the brain tissue. Uh, in this part, we cannot separate it from the brain tissue. We cannot remove it and we say that this is the optic nerve. It is merging within the brain tissue. And then the other part, which is the nerve passing through different places, will go through each one of them according to the anatomical position where clinical anatomy applied. So in uh, imaging, we could allocate the third nerve here. We can, we can uh, allocate the third nerve in, in the uh, imaging here again. Of course, you cannot see it uh, unless you ask for it. So they have the special cut while during the imaging uh, to, to see the optic nerve in MRI. Now, we go back to the anatomy, anatomy of the oculomotor nuclei complex. Uh, actually, who described this anatomy was Warwick divide into pair of subnuclei. Each subnuclei innervate a single extra ocular muscle. So as we said that op, uh, oculomotor nerves supply different muscles in the eye, so each subnuclei go to a specific place. Let us see. In general, it's, it have been allocated in A, V shape, complex light uh, lies at the level of the superior colloquius in the midbrain. It divides into lateral group, which is uncross. That means uh, the right nucleus go to the right eye. That's what it means, uncrossed. So the right nucleus go to the right eye, the left nucleus uh, go to the uh, subnuclei go to the uh, left eye, and these uh, specific for the new subnuclei of the inferior rectus, inferior op oblique, and medial rectus muscle. Okay, there is other group which is crossed, which is the right the right uh, nucleus supply uh, the the nerve uh, the the nuclei supply the left eye, and the left nuclei supply the right eye and this in specific for the superior rectus and there is a medial central caudal one which go to both sides and this give innervation to bilateral levator to the bilateral both and the iris sphincter ancillary uh, muscle in both eye okay so you will find in the book these pictures for uh, the arrangement of uh, the nuclei of the third nerve. And you might see this picture, but let me give you another simple picture, which really, uh, if you take photo by phone or draw it, whatever, this is, this is a very easy, simple, picture, but it helped a lot in uh, finding the diagnosis according to the patient sign. Let me show you when I told you AV pattern. AV, that's A, and this is V, okay? The red, the green is the right side going to the right side, which is inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and medial rectus. So these in the right nucleus 
go to the right eye. And this is in the left nucleus, go to the left eye. So this is, we call it uncrossed, in A pattern, uncrossed. Inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and medial rectus. Great. Now we have here the subnuclei of the superior rectus. In the right side, in the right nucleus, the right subnuclei in the right oculomotor nerve nucleus, what it have in it cross. And this one cross, what that mean? That if the nuclei here is affected, the superior oblique in the left eye is going to be affected. While if the superior oblique or subnuclei here in the left eye is affected, the right eye superior oblique will be affected. While this caudal nucleus in the end of the V pattern, it, if it, this part is affected, we have bilateral levator palpebrae superioris and the parasympathetic fiber in both eye will be affected. Levator palpebrae superioris, that means we are going to have bilateral ptosis and if the parasympathetic fiber affected, we are going to have bilateral dilated pupil. So please, this diagram is very, very uh, important. Uh, we are going to depend on this uh, later on uh, in the uh, clinical localization uh, of the um, pathology of the oculomotor nerve. Now, so here, this is the nucleus which we talked about now, and the nerve will exit the midbrain in interpeduncular fossa between the midbrain and the bones. So here the nerve will go. What we call the nerve in this area, from when it leaves the nucleus until it leaves the midbrain, we call it fasciculus, okay? We call this part fasciculus. In this part, as I said before, we cannot separate the oculomotor nerve from uh, the brain tissue. It's merging within uh, the area which is path passing through. But what here it will, uh, while it pass, it will go through the red nucleus here, and it will go through the corticospinal tract or the cerebral peduncle. And this is another important clinical uh, landmark. Uh, we will talk about it later to remember. So, nucleus here, and this is the fasciculus, and this is the red nucleus and the pyramidal tract, okay? What happened to the nerve? The other important landmark, So here is the third. What is the other important landmark when it leave the brain, midbrain is this area. What is this area? Is when the nerve passing between the posterior uh, cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. This is another important landmark. Why? Because here we might have aneurysm in this area. So this is important clinical landmark. You should know about it. And here is just another diagram showing, this is the third nerve, how it is in between uh, the posterior cerebral artery and 
the superior cerebellar artery. And in this area is common for aneurysm might, if it, the aneurysm enlarged, making pressure on the oculomotor nerve. So uh, uh, this area is important clinical landmark we remember it because of localization where is the oculomotor nerve is affected and where it is is important for uh, managing the patient okay another uh, important landmark is when the nerve pass into the cavernous sinus in this area and then into the superior orbital fissure. So we have nucleus, fasciculus, red nucleus, peduncle. We have between the blood vessels, posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebellar artery, we have another important landmark in the cavernous sinus. We have important landmark in the superior orbital fissure before it divided into two area. Now here in the cavernous sinus, this is important landmark. You have to know the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. What there is in the cavernous sinus, here is the internal carotid artery in the middle. This is the internal carotid artery, but it is looping here. So part of it will be outside the sinus and part of it will be intracavernous sinus. Here is the in the wall. Uh, here is the oculomotor nerve. This is the trochlear nerve, three and four next to each other. These are the division of the uh, trigeminal nerve, uh, the uh, ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and here is the obtusant nerve in the middle near the internal carotid artery. This is important landmark because if it happened, there is something compressing or pressing in the cavernous sinus, we might have more than one nerve affected. So this is why it's important landmark. So you must know the anatomy for the cavernous sinus, it help you in all cranial nerve. Now, the other landmark, when it is the oculomotor nerve will go through the uh, uh, superior orbital fissure. And here we have the tendinous ring and outside the tendinous ring. And this is the optic nerve here. So what is this? Is the oculomotor superior division. And this is the abducent nerve. This is the oculomotor inferior uh, division. So both oculomotor uh, are within the ring and in between is the abducent nerve. What happened to the oculomotor nerve when it go after uh, the superior orbital fissure it divide into superior division go to the superior rectus levator palpebrae and inferior division go to inferior rectus inferior oblique medial rectus parasympathetic fiber ciliary ganglia short ciliary nerve iris ciliary body and pupil will constrict so here is uh, the division of the oculomotor nerve, superior division here, go to the levator palpebrae superioris, and to the superior rectus, inferior division, go to the inferior rectus and inferior oblique. And here is, we said that it carry the parasympathetic fiber through the inferior division, and then leave the inferior division to go to the ciliary ganglia and from the ciliary ganglia to short ciliary nerve go around until it reach the iris and this is why we might have if the 
oculomotor nerve parasympathetic fiber affected, we will have dilated uh, pupil. Now, we go to the clinical localization of the lesion of the third nerve. So we want to know where is the lesion. So lesion must be nuclear. Where is the lesion must be nuclear? If this area is affected, okay? If this area is having a lesion affecting this area, what we will have? Unilateral will have a, a unilateral uh, will have unilateral third nerve palsy and we will have superior rectus uh, palsy in the other eye so unilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral superior nerve palsy and this can happen in stroke ms and in tumor. Uh, I want to remove this, uh, so how to remove it. So what happened here, uh, this another lesion must be nuclear. If we have bilateral total third nerve, bilateral total third nerve, with spared levator and spared parasympathetic fiber. So if a lesion taking both this side without affecting the parasympathetic or, or, or this caudal nucleus, what will happen? We will have bilateral third nerve palsy, like the muscle will be affected, the inferior rectus, inferior oblique and medial rectus, superior oblique. So we will have third nerve palsy, pupil, the lid will be normal, there will be no tosis, and the pupil will be normal. So this is, the lesion must be in the nuclear. It can happen in stroke, in multiple sclerosis, or in the tumor. So here you know that this is not a peripheral cause of third nerve, and you need to find out maybe he having a stroke, maybe he having a tumor, maybe he have uh, a multiple sclerosis. Lesion cannot be nuclear. We cannot say that this is a nuclear lesion. If we have unilateral third nerve palsy with normal contralateral superior rectus, the other eye. So here is important when you have unilateral third nerve palsy, look to the other eye, check the other eye for superior oblique because superior rectus is crossed. Lesion cannot be nuclear, unilateral, total, complete, in one eye, complete third nerve palsy, so cannot be nuclear because the superior oblique is crossed and the caudal nucleus will make bilateral ptosis. Lesion cannot be nuclear, unilateral ptosis. Why? Again, the caudal central nuclei will do bilateral uh, ptosis. Fasciculus lesion. You know now what is fasciculus. The nerve have already left the third nucleus, so that the ocular manifestation are present only on one side, okay? So if the fasciculus in the right eye and the right side is affected, we have right third nerve palsy. If it is in the left side, it is left third nerve palsy. But what, what else 
is characteristic of the fasciculus. Fasciculus lesions are always ischemic, infiltrated, or tumor, uh, or rarely inflammatory. But what is the characteristic of the fasciculus? It always needs to have company. It does not become isolated. There's another neurological manifestation with fasciculus lesion. Like, let us see here, make it simple. Uh, without even the name uh, of uh, the syndrome, uh, well, I can, let us think of how clinically we diagnose. Okay, this is here, we said this is the red nucleus. Okay, this is the uh, nucleus uh, of the oculomotor, and here is the fasciculus. Here is pathing uh, within the red nucleus. What the red nucleus, if it's affected, will cause? It will cause SP lateral cranial nerve palsy and contralateral arm and leg tremor. Anything apart from the fasciculus here in the, in the brain, right side here will be in the left, left side will be in the right. So if the red nucleus is affected with the fasciculus, we will have what called Bendict syndrome and it's sp lateral cranial nerve with contralateral arm and leg tremor so if you have a third nerve palsy and you just ask the patient put your hand in front of you put your hand straight in front of you and you see tremor tremor in the other arm you will think that it might be central cause. So this is a simple here. You might think of asking the patient to raise his hand straight in front of him and check if there is tremor. And by this, you will be very smart uh, to diagnose that this is a third nerve nucleus, secondary to central cause. Patient might have might have a tumor, might have a serious condition, you want to refer him urgent to the neurology. And you, uh, when you order imaging, you know that might be something in the midbrain. So you see how you are smart here. You are the first people to diagnose and see the patient in the ER. Now let us go to what happened if this was okay, nothing was happening here, but here is the superior peduncle is affected, this green. What, we, what will happen here in the fasciculus? It's called Whipper syndrome. What happened is ipsilateral uh, oculomotor nerve palsy because we said right and the right, left and the right, so it's the same side with contralateral arm and leg weakness. Here is becoming weak. He cannot uh, hold things, or if he um, hold your hand, he cannot be hold it, uh, hold your arm. He cannot uh, hold it tight. So there is weakness, or maybe the patient limping because he have a weak leg. So here, uh, the red nucleus was tremor. The uh, cerebral peduncle make weakness. And what happened if the red nucleus and the cerebral peduncle is affected both together, a lesion taking this area, then we will have both. We will have contralateral tremor plus weakness. So simple. The only difficult is the name, but you know cerebral peduncle, you know red nucleus, you know what happened in each. At least you know this is a central midbrain lesion. Great. Here is infarction causing by a uh, whipper syndrome in the right uh, uh, midbrain involving the oculomotor fasciculus and the cerebral peduncle. And here 
is you see the infarct. So you see, if you, you know, when you ask for MRI or imaging, if you don't specify the area where you want to see, it is easily missed or not seen because it depends on the cut, it depends on where he is going to look. That's why always is important uh, to write when you order imaging, what is in your mind, what you see, what you're looking for. What is the area you want to examine? So I'm sure all of you now, if you will see a patient with third nerve and uh, weakness of the other uh, side of the uh, third nerve uh, lesion, weakness or tremor, you might think of central, you might ask for midbrain uh, imaging in a specific to rule out any infarction or uh, uh, MS or uh, any inflammatory process in this area. Now, what is the symptom? What is the symptom of the uh, patient presented with ocular motor in general? Pain may be present due to microvascular infarction or compression. So patient might complain of pain and might not complain of pain. Ptosis may be complete or incomplete. Diplopia is usually uh, oblique. So let us see this patient. What you see here rising the upper lid. So because he is having ptosis here. Now Centrally, this eye is deviated a little bit uh, temporarily. Here, patient is looking up and you see that this eye is not going up. So elevation, lack of elevation, loss of elevation. Here, patient is looking down and the patient cannot look down. Patient is looking to the right side and this eye no adduction and patient is looking to the left side and there is a, a, a abduction so six nerve is okay so this is a third nerve palsy if you notice here in this patient in a specific you can see this pupil is small this pupil is slightly enlarged. So here is the parasympathetic fiber is affected somewhere. So ptosis may be complete and incomplete. Ophthalmoplegia, we call ophthalmoplegia is a term used when there is a loss of movement of the extraocular muscle uh, in spite of the cause, okay? So, ophthalmoplegia, there is usually an exotropia in primary position with deficit in adduction, elevation, and depression. And isochoria occur with compression. Otherwise, the pupil is uh, are normal. So, when we have a pupil is affected, so we have to think that this patient have a very serious uh, disease. Uh, either there is compression, either by tumor or by aneurysm. So this is an important sign if there is an isochoria. Here, what we see here, the slit is, there is ptosis. A pupil here is affected. 
but here what else there is proptosis okay so maybe there is tumor locally pressing on the globe causing a parasympathetic fiber to be affected dilated pupil and third nerve so when we have pupil affected in the oculomotor nerve this is a neuro ophthalmic emergency so as we uh, talked before about the lecture of neuro ophthalmic emergency but anyway it's nice always to repeat so not to be missed so third nerve palsy plus dilated pupil is critical because posterior communicating aneurysm might be involved and isochoria develop at any time within five days of start of diplopia what that means that if a patient came to you in the er and he is telling you that uh, he have ptosis and uh, you examine you find that nicely uh, there is a complete ptosis lack of elevation depression and adduction pupil is not affected but here is the important question when this happened when this happened if it is happened within one day or two days there is a chance that this patient still he might be having for example aneurysm or maybe he is having intracranial lesion especially in aneurysm we are scared that the aneurysm aneurysm is like you remember in the tire of the car when there is bulge at first it is very small maybe in a couple of days it bulge until it rupture so this is the same thing sometimes happen in aneurysm so we don't want to be having an aneurysm where it's going to be ruptured in a couple of days so if the patient in your lab it is your responsibility so you still have to rule out aneurysm even if he did not have dilated pupil, if he present with you within the first, especially three days or four days from presentation. You have to be very careful and suspicious that this patient might have uh, an aneurysm. Here is, is showing uh showing uh that uh this is the third nerve and here is how it, the aneurysm can bulge until it pre uh, pressuring the nerve this is uh, just to show you a uh, big aneurysm this is in the middle cerebral artery and and this is another picture just to, to show you an intracranial aneurysm how it might appear sometimes the aneurysm is small they're not show in mra we when we order mri we order mra if the aneurysm is is, is big but if it is small and still we suspicious the only way is is to, to do ct angio and this is really will show if there is aneurysm or no. So what is the management? Urgent, MRI, MRA, or CT and you, and refer, uh, urgent referral to neuro to take an action and to be responsible about this patient. So your, um, your, you have to suspect the diagnosis and proper timing in referral. You will not wait for the next week or the next clinic of the neuro to be able to handle it. You have to suspect and have in your, in your own knowing that you are dealing with emergency and need to be referred immediately. 
remember immediate management uh, can save a patient uh, life. It is a curable but life-threatening aneurysm. So what happened if the cranial nerve third uh, pupil was sparing? What is can be the cause? It might be diabetes mellitus, temporal arthritis, hypertension can be a uh, cause. So what we will do, if for example, patient coming to you and he gave a history of 10 days of this came to the clinic, still you want to do a blood work up to know maybe he is diabetic and he does not know that their mind, blood pressure, ESR, C-reactive protein to be sure that he is not a case of temporal arthritis. Of course, you have to ask for other sign and symptom of temporal arthritis. You do CBC and differential in uh, any case that sometimes can causes even leukemia. Glucose tolerance case to be sure if, if he doesn't know his diabetes, VDRL and anti-nuclear antibody to rule out if there was any autoimmune disease. What we will do, we will follow the patient for three to four months. Most of the patient with ischemic third nerve palsy improve within the first months and show complete improvement within two months to maximum six months. So there will be improvement. If there is no improvement, you should change uh, your uh, diagnosis. So MRI, MRA, cerebral angio, if the pupil become dilated within the first five to six days of onset, if no significant improvement within the first three months, and apparent, if apparent regeneration sign develop, and we explained in previous lecture what is apparent degeneration, if other neurological signs develop, like papilledema, weakness, any other sign, then we are not dealing with ischemic uh, third nerve palsy. What is the etiology in general of third nerve? Trauma. It can be caused by trauma. So if the patient was uh, in the ICU and he have road car traffic accident and he have a lot of imaging, so you know that this is traumatic. Still, 12% can be neoplas. Vascular is 21, so we have to be very careful. Aneurysm, others unknown or undetermined. What is the differential diagnosis? Mycenae gravis, thyroid eye disease, migraine, re uh, restrictive orbitopathy. So we these are might mimic third palsy. Apparent regeneration, uh, regeneration of third nerve may result of structure being hooked up to fiber that terminate in another, uh, in another structure, like it might lead gaze dyskinesis, pseudo Van Graaffy sign, and versus Dwayne syndrome, or pseudo Leitner dissociation. Again, if there is apparent regeneration, abnormal movement uh, you see as he is improving, but when he look down, the lid go up. There is abnormal movement, which you cannot explain. This is apparent regeneration. We consider your diagnosis, and this is neuroophthalmic emergency. If you are following a patient with presumed diagnosis of uh, ischemic uh, third nerve palsy, and he develops sign of apparent regeneration, MRI scan and cerebral angio are indicated to rule out tumor or to rule out aneurysm because it might be caused by aneurysm, tumor, or history of previous trauma. So this is I'll just show you uh, cavernous sinus meningioma causing third nerve palsy plus cranial nerve, other cranial nerve pulse. If one or more of third, fourth, fifth 
nerve palsy with or without a pupil affected. It can be caused by tumor, cavernous sinus rhimposis, fistula of inflammation. So think of here, this is another anatomical area where is in the cavernous sinus. Patient might complain of diplopia. Partial third nerve palsy may cause horizontal, vertical, or oblique diplopia according to how the patient is looking or moving his head. Patient with complete third nerve palsy does not complete of diplopia because the eye is completely uh, closed. Here, I, I just want you, uh, I noticed uh, this uh, during my work in the clinic, that sometimes uh, the assistant take the vision and because the eye is closed uh, by the by the lid, whether partial or complete, he will report that this eye is having no light perception. So please be sure that if this happened to you, reopen the eye and take the vision yourself because a lot of time there is no change in vision and uh, the clinical assessment might just write no light perception because he did not elevate the eyelid uh, while he examining his vision. So please notice this. Ptosis may sometimes be the earliest change noticed by the patient or it may come with the same time of diplopia. So sometimes it come together and sometimes it is earlier the ptosis than the extraocular motility uh, affected the pupil might be affected or spared. Pain, post compressive and ischemic third nerve palsy may be painful. Persistent severe pain is more likely to be due to aneurysm than ischemia, if, if really was severe pain. Orbital, hemifacial pain, that was present for days or week before the onset of diplopia is likely to be due to aneurysm or tumor. So always ask if it was preceded by um, pain. Uh, you have to be able to ask yourself um, leading question in your mind. So symptom of underlying disease like symptom of giant cell arthritis. You can ask for a patient who has third nerve still and he old age. You have to ask about symptom of giant cell arthritis and you know what is the symptom. Does he have jocladication, uh, pain while eating, loss of weight, fever, uh, all these things. You might want to do ESR, C-reactive protein and uh, that will be one of your suspicious uh, in your mind. If there was severe headache, hormonal change, might be patient have, uh, if he have uh, pale disc or something, so think of pituitary tumor or something compressing uh, the chiasm. Headache, meningism, photophobia, due to subarachnoid hemorrhage, or posterior communicating artery start rupture. So the level of the patient orientation and uh, if he have uh, a sign of meningism. So this is uh, very important and very, very urgent. Here is just showing to you aneurysm. So from this lecture, I want you to write this question or take photo for it. And whenever you, you are reading the third nerve or you are studying, always ask yourself this question. What is the clinical, clinical finding of the third nerve palsy? What is the possible causes of the third nerve palsy? What is the significance of pupil sparing or pupil involved third nerve palsy?
okay? What is the appropriate workup for isolated third nerve palsy with pupil sparing? What is the appropriate workup for isolated third nerve palsy with pupil sparing? What is the appropriate workup for isolated third nerve palsy with pupil involved? What are the localizing symptom complex of the third nerve uh, nucleus palsy? Okay. What is the management of the third nerve palsy with apparent regeneration? And what is the sign of apparent regeneration? This question, I will go back to it. And important to be able to answer each question yourself and know the answer. And thank you. Shukran, Dr. Amaha. It was a very informative lecture. Uh, if anyone have a questions, uh, could you raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the questions? Thank you. Uh, so um, I cannot see any question. So I hope everybody uh, will study today third nerve palsy and put this question in your here is what do you mean saying partial third nerve palsy and why sometimes there is partial ptosis thank you okay partial third nerve palsy that mean for example incomplete ptosis or there is uh, adduction deficit but not complete elevation or depression deficit is not complete and this is incomplete third nerve palsy uh, not complete they might be happen with tumor pressure but not complete and uh, this is again you have to to have the dif other differential diagnosis where there is for example are you dealing with mycenia gravius or uh, this is partial third nerve palsy due to tumor or there is orbital uh, uh, restriction due to, for example, previous ANT surgery, and there is muscle entrapment, or or my uh, we dealing with mycenia gravia. This is what I mean, partial third nerve palsy. Um. Any more question? Any more others? Cannot see. Great. So, uh, no more question. I just have to close the session and thank you. And I hope you get benefit from this lecture. See you, I think, next week for visual field. Okay, good night, take care, stay home, stay safe.